What's going on? It's the DZ Report. Don't you know I love haters? Now, show you guys this. Now, so, I got laid off by Microsoft after three months of work. Now I'm scrambling for a new job to take care of my mom. Tiana Watts Porter is a 25-year-old tech recruiter who started at Microsoft in May. Watts Porter was laid off this week, leaving her scrambling for a job so she could take care of her mom. This is Watts Porter's story as told to writer for Tessa Latifi, who wrote the story. You know, this is told to, you know, an essay based on the conversation that she had with Tiana Watts Porter a 25-year-old tech recruiter from Dallas who was laid off from Microsoft and Watts Porter's employment and layoff has been confirmed by an insider or by insider. And when asked for comment, Microsoft did not respond. The conversation has been edited for length and clarity. So I started working as a senior tech recruiter at Microsoft in May but just four months later, I've already lost my job to the latest round of tech layoffs sweeping the industry. When I logged into work on Monday, I had several co-workers telling me there were layoffs and they had been affected. I immediately had a feeling that I was going to be impacted. Why would I be the exemption? As a contractor at Microsoft, I had an 18-month contract that was dependent on performance but the layoff ended my contract more than a year early. The things about layoffs is that they can feel indiscrim excuse me, indiscriminate. You can be a great employee with exemplary, exemplary performance and you can still be affected. I think companies are trying to prepare for the worst, a possible upcoming recession. Damn, she looked good. Um, excuse me. <laughs> Sorry about that. After the pandemic, many companies didn't recover the way they wanted to, and one way to adjust for that is to perform layoffs. Just look at how many high-profile tech layoffs there have been this year. From Better to Tesla to Robinhood to Microsoft, it's becoming common in our industry to get laid off. When I first realized that I may be laid off, I immediately called my mom and we prayed together. After an unfortunate health incident last year, I'm largely responsible for taking care of my mother and I wanted her to know that no matter what happened, she would be taken care of. I don't care if I have to become a delivery driver or start doing Lyft and Uber rides. I'm going to make sure my mom doesn't go without. It helped for us to pray together. My faith in God gives me hope. I know that God is going to see me through. It was easier for me to find work as a Microsoft contractor than a full-time employee. It's becoming more and more common for tech companies to rely on contractors. And as a person looking for a job, it's often easier to find contract work than full-time work. But it's also difficult because you don't have the stability and permanency of someone with a full-time position. I've even found that when I interview for full-time jobs, they see that I was a contractor in the past and are more inclined to hire me in that capacity. But it's really difficult to be a contractor because people don't realize that contractors have just as much, if not more experience, than full-time employees. That is true, what she's saying. I'm a senior tech recruiter with eight years of experience who specializes in C-suite and executive recruitment. But when layoffs come, contractors are often the first on the chopping block. I wish people understood that no matter how many or how few people are affected by the layoffs, it changes their lives. Some people may find new jobs within a week, but other people may be out of work for months. After my last few years of experience in the job market, I don't believe in company loyalty. I stopped believing in it because I know I'm just a number to any company I work for. In previous generations, people were told to graduate college and get a good job and work there until they retire and cash out their 401k accounts, but that's just not how it works anymore. If companies don't have loyalty to their employees, we shouldn't have any loyalty to them. I'm worried about my future. 
but I'm doing everything I can to make sure it's secure. I want to get to the next opportunity as soon as possible so that my mom knows she's taken care of. And even though I'm worried, I do find peace in knowing that God has already laid out what my future will be and he won't lead me astray. Now, that was from the beautiful, I like to say, Tiana Watts Porter. And she makes a, she makes a great point. And this is stuff that I want to tell people is that contractors make a lot more money, but sometimes they don't get employed that, that much. So that's why contractors have a savings. That's why they're more susceptible to save more than people who have a full-time job. A lot of these companies are starting to not, they, well, they've been outsourcing, but they're starting to move everything to the internet. So now that the inflation has come, companies are just laying people off. They're like, well, peace, we'll let you go. You know, which is understandable because you have to understand, people, is that companies now are being taxed more. And now that inflation is higher, it's hard for them to keep the cost of keeping employees with inflation because you got to think about the supplies that they get. The supplies are costing more because gas is higher. So companies that are, or excuse me, trucks or planes that are bringing these things over for companies to use these supplies, they're taxing, they're taxing on companies or people who are owners or corporations who are owners. So they feel like, okay, I could hire a contractor like for like six to 12, like for six months or sometimes three months, maybe a few weeks, things like that. And then they could get rid of them as opposed to hiring an employee who's going to be there for like a while, like maybe a year and have to risk having to pay them the 401k, the medical bills and all. I mean, getting, get, giving them um, benefits and all of that stuff. Some companies don't even give you benefits. You get paid more, but you don't get no benefits. You have to find a way to get your own benefits. Some people take up a second job. Some people take up a third job. You know, in this economy, the economy has been very poorish. You know, and I think a lot of people don't realize, like, how bad it's been. The inflation and everything. You know, I hope um, Tiana, or Tiana, excuse me, I believe that's how you pronounce it you know, gets back on her feet and do what she has to do. But that's tough to hear. And I don't think people understand how, you know, blessed they are to have a job because some people get laid off and, you know, it is what it is. So now here's another story. In her own words, SC Mega Millions winner's testimony shows how she lost $83 million to the New York attorney. Um, this is by Lynn Riddle. Um, I have the audio here. I'm going to play the audio of the story for you guys. Let me see if this is it. In her own words, SC Mega Millions winner's testimony shows... Fair USAC, fair USAC. ...to NY attorney. On the morning after she became a multimillionaire, a South Carolina woman drove by the KC Mart number 47 in Simpsonville where she bought her lottery ticket to see if anyone was there, just in case she had made a mistake and didn't really win. It was the largest Mega Millions jackpot to be won by a single ticket, more than $1.5 billion, and she had seen the numbers reported on television. If no one was there, I would say, okay, well this was a disaster, we made a mistake, and I'd drive home and all would be good. But as we went by the convenience store, there was every media, there was helicopters, there was every piece of media, there was locals, you know, national, I so badly wanted to get out of there. I wanted to go under the seat. I became anxious. That was some of her testimony in a trial earlier this year in which her lawyer, Jason Kurland, the self-proclaimed lottery lawyer, was charged with taking money from some of his clients, in her case more than $80 million. Mm. The South Carolina woman has never been identified and was allowed to testify using the pseudonym, Beth Smith. Just a quick word from our sponsor. Mary redeemed a $50,000. Her testimony offers a glimpse into her overnight transformation from insurance underwriter with only a 401k and a checking account to a wealthy retiree with a net worth of $600 million, the amount she received after taxes. Her story also provides a cautionary tale for those who come into large amounts of money unexpectedly, who trust professionals to do their jobs without a lot of oversight. 
The following narrative is taken from Beth Smith's testimony against Curland. Joy mixed with anxiety. When she saw the numbers on her lottery ticket matched all six numbers for the October 23, 2018 drawing, she felt a range of emotions, astonishment, disbelief, joy, anxiety. It was a great blessing, she thought, but also of great concern. She did not want to be someone in the public eye. In her late 50s, she and her husband, a lawyer, had a comfortable life. They had been married 36 years and had grown children. She didn't want riches to change anything. Even at the convenience store the next morning, she felt people were looking at her, somehow, they just who she was. She worried about her safety and that of her family. Anonymity was of utmost importance. They stashed the ticket in a safety deposit box until they decided what to do. We considered attorneys. We considered financial advisors. We considered accountants. We considered, you know, investment firms, that kind of thing, she said. They settled on an attorney because they knew who to bring in for other advice, plus an attorney would be bound to keep their confidences. They saw Curland, a New York attorney, on television talking about winning the lottery, their lottery. He had previously represented other big lottery winners including wins of $336.4 million in Rhode Island and $254.2 million in Connecticut. In his late 40s, he lived on Long Island with his wife and soccer-playing children and worked for the law firm Rifkin Radler. She thought the lottery lawyer named Gimmicky, but then saw him on the news. He was on, you know, the morning shows and the like, and it looked like he certainly knew about lottery, he had a specialty in lottery winners. And, you know, we looked online and he seemed very capable, Smith said. Her husband called Curlin from a burner phone in December 2018. They didn't want him to know their names. They met in Las Vegas shortly afterward. They needed Curlin to help collect the prize, distribute money to charity and most importantly keep their names out of the news. Over the next year and a half, his involvement in their financial lives would grow well beyond that. Collecting the prize. On March 4, 2019, five months after winning, the Smiths, the husband is called Steve in the trial transcript, met Curlin in Columbia. The precise location was not identified in court. Security from the South Carolina Lottery Commission picked them up and drove them to the lottery office on South Main two blocks from the state house. They pulled into an underground garage where security cameras had been turned off. Windows covered. It was a Sunday. Several lottery officials attended the meeting. The Smiths turned in their ticket, which brought them $878 million before taxes. Mm. Curland was paid a flat fee of $200,000. Then a few days later, Curland informed the media. He said the woman was from South Carolina, visiting Greenville and chose to take a scenic drive during some downtime. The Greenville News reported. On a whim, she stopped at the KC Mart. She had decided to give money to the City of Simpsonville Arts Center, Ronald McDonald House of Charities of Columbia, 1SC Fund, for Hurricane Florence Relief, in the middle of Columbia and the American Red Cross Alabama region, Tornado Relief Fund. Curland did not say how much went to each. Curland had opened an account at Bank Lumi USA, headquartered in New York City, to be distributed to four other large American banks, $100 million to two and $50 million to two others. In-house money managers would handle investments. We were very adamant that we wanted this to be invested in a very conservative way because my husband and I believe this was, this blessing was going to be provided to my family and generate, and we would have it generationally. So, we didn't need to take any, any risk in doing that, she said. The accounts were set up in Curlin's name to protect their anonymity. He had access to it. We did not. He set it up as if it was, basically, his account, she said. They did not get statements or balance information. All information would come from Curland. The Smiths agreed to pay him $50,000 a month for his services going forward. Included in those services was arranging for Smith's husband to go to the Masters and her sister and brother-in-law to go to the Kentucky Derby. At one point Curland sent Steve Smith an autographed photo of Daniel Rudy Rudiger, whose story of getting to play football at Notre Dame was made into a movie. The deals come in. Two days after claiming the money, Curlin brought two investments to the Smiths, JBMML and Cheddar Capital. Both lend money to small businesses. The Smiths would invest $20 million in JBMML and $10 million in Cheddar at an interest rate of 9%. The interest in turn would go to a family fund called Cedar Ridge Partnership to be distributed as monthly income of $12,500 apiece to 10 family members. The next month, Curland offered a deal he said he and other lottery winners had done well with, a diamond merchant, who would pay $2 million on a $12.6 million investment in six months. Then in May, Curland suggested they invest in thoroughbred racehorses. 
$1 million would get them three horses and feed and train them for a year. Mm. In March 2020, at Curlin's suggestion, they invested $19.5 million in a company that was hoping to provide PPE to the state of California. The Smiths rocked along. They bought a new house in South Carolina, another in another state and a place for a family member outside the United States. They bought a hotel. Tens of millions in real estate transactions. Then cracks started to show. The payments, to family members, were very irregular. Sometimes it would go direct from the company to my family member, Cheddar Capital and JBMML. They were not the amounts of monies that we were, you know, guaranteed in these documents and it was very concerning. Terribly concerning. She learned the diamond merchant Greg Altieri was being investigated after she was contacted by the FBI. Curlin reassured her. All was well. The government described the merchant's business as a Ponzi scheme when he was arrested. Then, Curland himself and three others who were in on the deals involving the Smiths and two other lottery winners were arrested. That was August 2020. The scramble is on. Smith said she had no idea initially how to gain access to her money. I didn't even know who the wealth investors, the mm. wealth advisors were, she said. You don't just call the 800 number and, you know, be talking to someone. It was a long, tedious process, and she worried that if Curland was out of jail he still had complete control over her money. I wanted, you know, a stop put to that, she said. She had to get a certified copy of the lottery ticket. The commissioner drove it to her house. We were very grateful, she said. Each bank had its own requirement for proving the money was hers. Smith said there were many bits of information Curlin never shared, such as he earned a 1% finder's fee on some investments and had an interest in JBMML and Cheddar. Mm. He bought two horses, not three. And worst of all, took $19.5 million from her account without permission. Mm. Asked in court why Curlin took the money, she said, the only thing I can think of is theft. She said she had no idea where the money went. Bloomberg News, in a story published before Curlin's trial, exposes the twists and turns of Curlin's life from a Hofstra Law School graduate working on small-time real estate deals to becoming involved with people on the margins of organized crime. Curlin and his associates were accused of siphoning lottery winnings to pay for boats, luxury cars, country club memberships, and other cliches. Oh, and one of the crew threatened to murder the family of a man who turned out, inconveniently, to be a federal informant, the magazine said. The magazine said prosecutors intended to allege that Curland, Frank, Smookler, and, Frank, Russo used lottery winnings as a slush fund for personal expenses such as a Range Rover and a shopping spree at Dick's Sporting Goods. In July, a Brooklyn, New York, jury unanimously convicted Curland of five counts of wire fraud, honest services wire fraud and money laundering, according to court documents. The government estimated Curland caused losses to three lottery winners of more than $100 million. Curlin pleaded not guilty, saying he was deceived by others who were also charged in the scheme. Two of them, Francis Frank Smookler and Francesco Frank Russo testified against Curlin, both of whom previously pleaded guilty to wire fraud, money laundering and extortion and are awaiting sentencing. Also charged in the case was Christopher Cheershow, who Bloomberg described as owning a Staten Island plumbing business and has been identified in the New York tabloids as a Genovese crime family soldier. He pleaded guilty to fraud and money laundering and is awaiting sentencing. Federal prosecutors had tapes of the co-conspirators talking about their scheme, court records said. Diamond Merchant Altieri pleaded guilty in 2020 to wire fraud. In the meantime, Beth and Steve Smith are left to wonder why. Do you think if you just asked better questions in this case, that these things wouldn't have happened? The prosecutor asked Beth Smith. Oh, I don't believe that at all. I think they would have happened, regardless of the number of questions I asked. This story was originally published August 13th, 2022, 5 a.m. Next article. So, that's, um, that's how it is. To me, the problem is them. Why would you, you know, why would you ever give up all your information like that? See, people, even if you... Give it to somebody. Know what's going on. You know, this is basic elementary school or middle school type of teaching from your parents. But if you didn't have parents to teach you this stuff, then you wouldn't know. You can't trust everybody. Now, when they did have these people come in as advisors and stuff, they should have got the codes and everything to all of the banks they're using. They should have saw the paperwork. If you look at the paperwork, 
they should have also had a lawyer present. I mean, well, they're lawyers. The, the, the husband was lawyers. I can't believe he let this happen. If you're a lawyer, you need to look over this stuff. You need to ask for paperwork and ask for receipts of everything that's going on. You can't just go out there and say, oh, I trust this. Come on, we're in a new century. Everyone's out here a scammer. You got to think that way. So let me know what you guys thought about both articles. Um, thank you for listening. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe, share this. Hit that notification bell to select all to receive upcoming notifications. And if you guys love what you hear, you can go to the description box. Hit that link to my cash app. You could donate whatever your hearts desire. Thank you guys for listening. This is the DZ Report and we're signing off. Peace.